record. All right. Good evening, everybody. Recording for real this time. I, <laughs> we are here live bringing you V Brown Bag on a Wednesday night. Uh, we are excited to welcome David Klee tonight, who's going to be talking virtualized SQL Server and how to actually get good performance out of it. Woohoo! Uh, but before we dive into that, we're going to do a few housekeeping notes. Um, we want you to be part of this discussion tonight. So if you're watching live, please use the Q and A feature here in Zoom and uh, let us know when you have a question. I will be watching that and I will be watching Twitter hashtag vbrownbag if you're uh, if you, that's your preferred means of communication, let us know what you think. Let us know what you want to hear about, and we will uh, get your questions to our speaker. Um, if you are watching this after the fact and it's recorded on YouTube, uh, welcome. Thank you for watching. Did you know we have other shows you can join besides this one? So we're recording what, live on a Wednesday night, 8.30 p.m. Eastern, 7.30 p.m. Central. We have multiple other shows throughout the weeks in different regions and different languages. Be sure to check them out and join as you can. Uh, if you're watching this on uh, live, don't forget about the YouTube channel then, which we just mentioned, vbrownbag.com slash YouTube. Uh, I'm your host, I'm Ken Nalbone, and I'm very excited to introduce David Klee. Hello, David, welcome. Hello. Hey, I am going to stop sharing my screen and pass it over to you and you can take it away. <clears throat> Sounds good. Let me get my screen shared here and come on, zoom, there we go. Okay, can you see my screen okay? I can see your screen and I can see your lovely smiling face. Awesome. <laughs> so hello everybody, this is virtual SQL servers and serious actual performance. So I bet you didn't know you could virtualize some really, really big stuff. I'm gonna show you how, it's a lot of fun. And I tend to get a little excited with this kind of stuff, but I'm an absolute geek with this stuff. <laughs> Uh, my name is David Klee. Uh, I am lucky enough to be a Microsoft Data Platform MVP and a VMware V expert. Basically means I get a little bit of insider knowledge on where they're going with stuff and I get, I'm able to contribute to really the futures and the direction of a lot of the things that I really care about. And that's essentially how infrastructure and database technologies work together and uh, well, most of the time don't play nice together. <laughs> um, let's see, I am the founder of Heroflux Technologies Consulting Company where we do this professionally. I also just recently launched a company called Sequilibrium. It is an on-demand video training service and the very first course that we released eight and a half hours of a technical deep dive on, you guessed it, SQL Server on VMware. Go check it out if you're interested. There's a lot of really nerdy stuff on there. Okay. So from a virtual machine admin standpoint, how many times have any of the data professionals in your organization come to you and said, I'm getting absolutely terrible storage performance. Everything is wrong. It's broken. It's all your fault. And then you look at the SAM and everything's perfectly fine. <clears throat> but they've got all this telemetry that says they've got really horrible storage performance, really bad everything. Well, do not disregard that. This is a really common occurrence. And what you'll find is that there are bottlenecks inside SQL Server. There's bottlenecks inside Windows and the virtualization layer with a lot of really silly defaults. There could be bottlenecks inside the physical infrastructure underneath, all before it gets to the storage device, which has got the telemetry on that says, hey, stuff's cool. I'm gonna show you how these things are different and how they play poorly together, to be frank. These are really common challenges. This particular scenario, these are real numbers. I got involved with a consulting gig and um, the DBAs and the storage admins had literally been yelling at each other for six and a half months before I got there. So meeting number one, they join in the room, they start yelling at each other, storage dude picks up a chair and throws it. He's so upset that he has to deal with the same old problem again. He is always, I'm right, you're wrong, be quiet. <clears throat> What we found, he was right, and so was the DBA. Major interconnect bottlenecks in between with a CPU misalignment, big challenge. <clears throat> okay, now for this audience, I don't need to tell you what virtualization is. For a lot of database folks, it's still kind of a black box and unknown. The way I treat virtualization is that it is a set of compute resources on each host that you then divvy up and assign to the virtual environment for the virtual machines, the operating systems, the applications that run on them. These compute resources are finite. <clears throat> we have scheduling queues 
inside the hypervisor that allows us to leverage these compute resources in a shared everything environment. So now think about it this way. It's compute resources and queues to get there. My goal is to spend the least amount of time in the queue. If we can do this, we can get bare metal performance or really, really close to it. You can have a lot of fun with this as long as everything is managed and lined up properly. And that's the challenge. There's defaults in all these things. There's differing opinions. There's telemetry that tells you different things. You got to be careful with it. So it's in a normal database stack. And this includes VMware on the cloud. Any one of the major cloud providers can now get VMware on there. We've got storage of some kind. <clears throat> There's a physical server in there. There's a virtualization layer. There's interconnects and networking to let everything communicate. The virtualization layer has virtual machines with an operating system. And then from a database perspective, you have a SQL Server instance, one or more databases, and the applications that connect in all of this to get the data and do stuff with it. I always joke, we have four main food groups with this stuff to make sure that everything is performing properly. The primary one is CPU. The next one is memory. Now, if you're doing this right, you're usually not oversubscribed when it comes to the big database servers. So it's generally kind of a non-issue anymore, hopefully. The storage layer is next. Flash and NVMe storage shifts the bottleneck back up further into the stack. So most of the time we're okay. There's some bottlenecks and defaults in there that we kind of do need to take care of. And there's networking, usually not that big of a deal, but occasionally we find some hiccups in there. So we're really gonna focus in on CPU and storage on this one. We're gonna start at the bottom. We're gonna start on storage. <clears throat> so the data's gotta be stored somewhere. Now you've probably set one of these things up to a data professional. They've probably never ripped apart storage and tried to have you know, the, all the stuff work properly and all, all the configuration and everything. There's a lot that goes into it. From their perspective, they ask for storage. They get a data store to put a virtual disk on or they get a line directly connected to a VM. <clears throat> you and I know there's a lot more to it. There's a disk pool of different types of disk. There's a controllers that have CPUs, interconnects, cache memory, you know, you know, SSDs for buffering, all this stuff. You provision a LAN, that gets mapped to a data store, that gets presented so you can put your virtual disk on there. We gotta be careful because there are storage interconnects, bottlenecks at almost every one of these layers and that gets a real challenge. Okay, first of all, <clears throat> If a database administrator asks you for multiple disks, listen to them. These are the standards that they've been doing for years and a starting point. Now, this, may, this is probably not the end point, but a starting point that I consider a very reasonable deployment. OS for the C drive, no big deal. Usually they may ask for a small drive to install SQL Server onto, and this is partly for you. You can take a snapshot of the operating system, mark the rest of the disk snapshot independent, and you can roll back an operating system but not lose any of the data that may have trickled in while you're doing the patch. <clears throat> if they do heavy database replication or really heavy job loads, you know, middle of the night kind of stuff, or if they're using a SQL Server high availability solution, you may need to provision another disk for the system databases, specifically the master model and MSDB databases. They may be pretty small, but they're usually pretty active. So a, couple, um, a lot of times we'll want to put those on a separate virtual disk. They're going to ask you for independent disks for user database data logs and a construct called the temp DB or the temp database. <clears throat> The reason they're asking for more than one data volume is because sometimes these things are really big and we're talking multi-terabyte systems. And what you find is that the database engine and the operating system may be bottlenecked with a single queue to get to that disk. So if you spread out the SQL Server workload amongst multiple disks, you end up with a little bit better performance and every little bit helps. Same thing with our transaction logs. It's not like a regular log. Every change that goes into that database gets stored to the log first and it's gotta be there. TempDB is a regular database, but it's basically a garbage collection dumping ground for everything that people are doing from transient operations to version control systems to all this kind of stuff. 
it's got to be there. And there are some environments where the TempDB database load is really significant. And we can, I mean, I've seen a TempDB load at, you know, about a gig and a, a gig, 1.5 gigabytes per second writes to this thing. That's pretty significant. <clears throat> now, if you are paging to disk considerably, which I really hope you aren't, um, there is sometimes a reason to put the Windows page file on its own virtual disk. Part of this is because if I'm doing something like Zerto or LUN replication, I may actually park this on a LUN that is less frequently replicated, or maybe only replicated once. It's kind of fun because if there's a lot of churn inside that file, I don't need it. I don't need it to turn the virtual machine on, so don't replicate it. Same thing goes with the tempdb drive. Zerto's actually got an option to mark this as a uh, page disk. It replicates the folder structure, doesn't deal with the contents, and that's fine. It gets recreated every time you start up the database engine anyway. There's one environment we were lucky enough to catch this. We flipped the switch. It reduced their bandwidth demand so much for their entire business that they were able to take an MPLS circuit and cut the overall bandwidth in half, save them like two grand a month. <clears throat> Now, some DBAs like to do database level backups locally onto that machine and then let whatever backup agent go and fetch it and carry it off of there. Put that on a different disk, no problem. Other times I'll write it over the network, no big deal. Now, there is a concept here with the VMware Paravirtual SCSI controller driver. If you've never used this, it's installed with the VMware tools. It's part of Windows now, and you can actually get ver uh, driver updates through Windows Update at this point. But essentially, <clears throat> the default is the LSI Logic SAS controller. Not a big deal, except it's got a default queue depth of just 32 concurrent I.O. operations. If you're on a flash or NVMe, that's far too low. The underlying storage can handle a lot more than that. So a long time ago, VMware wrote the Paravirtual SCSI controller, PV SCSI. <clears throat> the fun part there, it has default queue depth of 64 concurrent IO operations. It uses less CPU associated for uh, storage commands. Your latency to disk will be a little bit lower. Your max throughput will be a little bit higher. But if you're on all flash, that extra Q depth is going to get you more bang for the buck. You get up to four disk controllers inside VMware. Use them all. <clears throat> How you distribute this thing is going to be really dependent on your load. That's really tough to gauge from here, not knowing your environment. But if you have something like VROPS or Perfmon and Guest or any of the database monitoring tools or SolarWinds Orion, you can actually track consumption per disk, look at the patterns, make sure that they don't collide or compete, and then use these four SCSI controllers to attach these virtual disks to, to really widely distribute the load. Windows does storage coalescing, not just by disk, but by disk controller. So does VMware. The more appropriately that you use these disk controllers, the more improvement you get with concurrent IO operations getting to the underlying SAN and back. You're able to multipath better. It's able to load balance. Life is better. <clears throat> now, starting with 6.5, you have the NVMe controller. If you are using NVMe-based storage underneath, remember that whole you know 64 concurrent queues? Yeah, the NVMe controller, it's more like 65,000 queues. <laughs> That's what NVMe can actually do. You can use the NVMe controller in addition to the Paravirtual SCSI controller if you're on NVMe storage. Really, you can use it without it. You get a better bag for the buck with it. Please note, if you have storage connected to an NVMe controller in a virtual machine, you cannot resize the virtual machine disk without a reboot. You can do it in VMware. It will act like it applies it. You'll never see it in guest. You reboot the VM, there it is. <clears throat> Just a little nuance with the way they deal with the NVMe controller standard there. Don't really like it, but it is what it is. <clears throat> Good info, David. Quick question. Uh, yeah. There. So you mentioned the page file not needing to be uh, replicated for recovery. And Graham is asking, what about the temp DB? Does it need to be uh, available for recovery? <clears throat> Great question. Um, the folder and the drive itself that TempDB resides in needs to be around for recovery, but the actual contents of the TempDB database do not. That actually gets recreated every time the database uh, server starts up. So save the bandwidth, 
don't worry about replicating it. <laughs> Just make sure that drive and what that folder and whatever permissions are on it are there at the destination and then life is good. Good info. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, people often ask me, how do you figure out how to balance these things? Well, you know, if you've got the third party utilities that can collect the raw data, great, use them. A lot of us don't have the kind of budget to be able to buy this kind of stuff. For me, I'm at the mercy of whatever my customers have, and sometimes they don't have much. So if you are interested, you have Windows Perfmon built into Windows for all of this stuff. Go out to this link here. There's absolutely no strings attached, no contact info required. It literally takes you to a page with a PDF on there. This will show you exactly how we set, how we like to set up Windows Perfmon for ongoing 24 by 7 collection. I've measured it at less than 1% of one CPU core. It runs every 30 seconds, stores it to the file system. It rotates every night. It makes sure that you do not fill up your file system. It actually checks, and after a few days, it'll compress the files into a CAB file. Now, everybody on the internet says collect Perfmon data, right? <clears throat> well... I'm going to tell you what to do with it. For the DBAs of the group, work with them. We recently released a GitHub PowerShell script out there that I call BLG to SQL. BLG is a binary log file. That's the output of Perfmon. You now have the ability to take that Perfmon information and load it into a SQL server. So all the analytics tools in your environment, like Power BI or just straight T-SQL or Excel, all this stuff, you have the ability to get to the raw data now. And with that, now you can start to figure out trends, analytics, anomalies in there. And it's a lot more granular if you do this at a 30-second interval than anything you're going to get out of VROPS or any of the mo other monitoring tools. It puts out raw data in your hands. You can correlate this with anything with any of the other tools in your environment. But having that raw data is incredibly powerful. Now, from a storage perspective, here's one other thing. If you have data savings available on your underlying storage, you know, screenshot here is from Pure Storage, but Nimble, uh, Extreme IO, I mean, you name it, there's a lot of different vendors out there that do data reduction. They can do it in the form of compression and or deduplication. <clears throat> you really, really, really need to work with your DBAs on this one. There are times where their security requirements are going to be more strict than what you have on the storage. Like, for example, Pure is self-encrypting on disk. No problem. A lot of times DBAs are under some stricter requirements, and they'll actually elect to encrypt the database. When they do this, your compression ratios are going to be zip. <laughs> but if they have multiple copies of the databases, say, you know, a production copy, and then they'll refresh it to a dev machine periodically, and then refresh it to a, a UAT environment, you can deduplicate fairly well. But the act of trying to compress something that is already compressed could be kind of tough. So just double check with them. How are they using each of the LUNs that you present? Because a lot of times, I mean, I, I literally found this just a couple of days ago company had 300 terabytes for SQL Server backups. They were running compression and deduplication. The dedupe side of it worked pretty well. It was quite literally, they had a seven-day retention. It was a seven-to-one dedupe rate. It was actually really cool. They were trying to compress at a really strong algorithm on a uh, Tejrial Tintry array. And what ended up happening was the act of trying to compress it, they ended up with 0.01% data savings because of the compression. That is an absolute waste of CPU time on the SAN. They could be doing better things with it. So work with your DBAs. If they're doing table level compression, if they're doing table level or database level encryption, this can reduce your data savings. Was there a question? I saw it pop up for a second. Yeah, a couple from Graham. Uh, cool. Storage related. You know, one was, you know, I think this is more on the VMware side, you know. Yeah. How is vMotion handled with NVMe storage? Might not be in scope. If you don't know the answer to that one, we can circle back on it. And yeah. then are there any, issue, any issues with storage that only does thin provisioning? Great questions. Um, so storage vMotion with NVMe, not a big deal. It's pretty much handled just like everything else. Um, uh, sorry, what was the second question there? Uh, uh, storage that uh, only does thin provisioning. Any issues there? Ah, storage that does thin provisioning. Um, 
it depends on how fast the storage is. If you're on really fast storage, uh, the act of doing a thin provision, so if, if you follow the academic best practices, they're going to tell you to thick provision, eager zero, everything, at least from a production standpoint. Realistically, you know, I'm, I'm pretty pragmatic with this stuff. Um, if you've got a good array that's really fast, I mean, you know, just you pick the big, fast machines out there. Realistically, you could barely even measure a thin provisioned disk. I mean, you're really looking at any time a block gets written to for the first time, it writes zeros on the block. You can measure it. You're not really going to notice any difference. Good info. Thank you. Cool. <clears throat> okay. I could go down the rabbit hole for the next three hours on storage. I won't, but if there are any follow-up questions, I, I'll be around as long as we need tonight. I'm happy to answer any of this stuff because I'm a geek and I like the topic. <laughs> okay. Networking, pretty straightforward. The biggest thing here is that we know everything's got to communicate. I really, really hope your environment doesn't look like this. These were real. Um, the way I look at it, most of the time the networking just works, but Database professionals especially love to pump a lot of traffic on the network for things like big database backups or nightly ETL where they're moving data around. So from my perspective, I want you to be careful. Simply verify and test the end-to-end -end performance between either the database servers and the app servers or the database server and where they're writing their backups to. Um, there is a free utility that you can use called iPerf. It's pre-compiled for Windows and it's actually in a lot of the package management systems on Linux, the Windows one, iPerf 3. So we have a free guide out here. Again, no strings attached, just a plain page, uh, hfxte.ch slash iPerf. <clears throat> the way to do this on the, you have two copies of this little executable. On our destination, run it from an elevated command prompt or PowerShell prompt, iperf3 space minus s, make it a server. On the other machine that is going to be our originator, so iperf minus c and then the other machine name or IP, minus t, 10 for 10 seconds. Now, on anything greater than a one gig network, iperf is a little inefficient. So what I do is tell it to do 10 worker threads. So minus capital P 10 is gonna do 10 worker threads. And what you get is an output that looks like this. So over that 10 seconds, iperf is done. It copied 10.3 gigabytes of data at 8.8 .8 gigabit per second. On a 10 gig network, it's pretty good. I'm pretty happy with that. But what you can find is that if the output isn't nearly what you expect, it's a real easy way to actually troubleshoot that, hey, you know, something's not right. Go review the network settings and stack, rerun the test after you make some changes, see if you get a performance gain. You'd be amazed at the amount of network misconfigurations that I see around routing. And one 40 gig network, uh, they were doing a database backup and it was capping out at 112 megabytes a second. Well, the routing accidentally routed it from a 40 gig switch through a one gig interface to another 40 gig switch. And, uh, you know, figure that out. And it's like, yeah, that's not very good. So they went and took care of that and everything was fine. But a real quick and simple check, it goes a long way with this stuff. Now, the monitoring side of this is one that I really do find some challenges with. Some areas people are floating blind and what I'm really looking for here is port congestion. It goes a long way. So we have monitoring inside the virtual machine at you know, Windows or Linux at the virtual NIC. There could be the interface coming out of the back of the machine. And if you have a blade chassis like Cisco UCS, be really careful that you're monitoring the blade interconnect coming out of the back of the chassis. A lot of times this is really not visible from the VMware layer and everything could be fine, but you could actually be saturating those fiber uplinks pretty easily. And it's not very fun. There's the individual switches and the interconnects on the switches. And then all the way into the controllers on each of the SAN controllers and, or the net, network adapters on those, it goes a long way. <clears throat> I find odd bottlenecks in a number of places and you just gotta be careful with these things because flash arrays can saturate a network or a fiber stack, you know, the database backup layer, ETL, these things will just kill your environment. And you just gotta be careful with them. A little bit of extra TLC, a little bit of extra monitoring goes a long way here. Now, any questions on networking? I haven't seen any coming <clears throat> to networking now. Okay, cool. 
So we're going to hit CPU architecture a little bit. <clears throat> now, I always defer to Frank Deniman on this one. The guy is an absolute master with this. But from a SQL Server and relational database perspective, the choice in the architecture of the CPU will make or break these environments. And I'm not exaggerating this. So in this is the CPU package. You have L1 cache and L2 cache per compute core. You've got last level cache or L3 cache that is shared amongst the cores. And then there is this area that they call, because of marketing, the uncore. And it's basically just a collection of everything else that is needed. The thing in there that I want you to remember is the memory controller. And that'll be important here in a minute. So for those of you that have never opened up one of these things, yeah, they look really cool. Their you know, little chip fits in your hand. There's probably a thousand little gold pins that pop out of the bottom of it. If you drop one of these, you will cry. Uh, so just be careful with that. Now, where does this package connect into? This is a picture of a four CPU socket mainboard. Next to them, these black lines here with the white little tabs on the top, that's for uh, computer memory. We got four sockets on here. Why? Well, Go back in the day, this is probably about 20 years ago, give or take. We had what's called a uniform memory access architecture. So let's say we had a handful of CPUs, we had some RAM, all of those connected to each other through the memory controller located in the Northbridge chip on the mainboard. Well, there's a challenge here. <clears throat> CPU density started to go up with multiple cores. Memory density started to go up. And what we've got is a bottleneck this memory controller started to become the principal bottleneck to scalability. Okay, let's find a different way to design this. So on the x86 platform, AMD pioneered it, Intel perfected it. They came up with this thing called a non-uniform memory access node or a NUMA node. And what they did, they pulled the memory controller off the main board, stuck it inside the CPU. And then they put memory really, really, really close to an individual CPU socket. And this is called a NUMA node or one socket and all the memory that is essentially directly connected to it. <clears throat> now, why does this matter? Well, look at it this way. I have a CPU package with an onboard memory controller and here's my RAM. They can move back and forth really, really, really fast, really good local access. Now, CPU package zero can access the memory connected to CPU package one, but it's got to go through some interconnects here through its memory controller to the memory and all the way back. And what you find is that if I'm doing a lot of remote memory lookups, my performance can take a hit. Why does the SQL server environment and any other relational database engine have such a big memory footprint? It's a storage read cache. So we're really dependent on the speed of RAM. So what we need to do is to take this awareness of NUMA and make sure that the virtual machine gets the appropriate configuration so that our workload will best line up with everything underneath it. If we do that, and then the DBAs tell the SQL server layer to how, really how to take the best advantage of that architecture, we get faster performance and we do it quickly. And literally within like three or four clicks, we can make upwards of anywhere from a five to a 50% performance gain. Cool. Was there a question there? Yeah, Graham was wondering if with SQL standard and 128 gig of RAM is uh, NUMA an issue? Great question. Enterprise problem. <clears throat> um, believe it or not, I actually want to show you an example of this. I'm going to show you why it's that important. <laughs> um, so actually, um, Graham, are you running SQL Standard Edition uh, that's fairly current? There we go. He said, yep, yeah, because they're on software assurance. Cool. <clears throat> okay. So I'm going to give you an example of what I consider my own personal hell. <laughs> Um, so I do a lot of perfmon analysis and what this is, this is perfmon. <clears throat> okay, this is a SQL Server Standard Edition, 2017, pretty current, uh, Windows 2016, SQL Server 2017. I went in, did a little bit of consulting and doing a health check for somebody and I went and noticed that my perfmon output showed that this thing was pretty darn busy. This was a 16 core edition uh, or 16 core deployment of SQL Server Standard Edition. Okay, well, the maximum addressable core count on there is 24 cores, 
or four sockets, whichever is lower. Okay, no problem. So take a look at those. This thing is active around the clock, literally between 35 and 56%. So I asked a really basic question when I started talking to them about this. Are you a nine to five shop? The answer came back is no. It's like, okay, so that's interesting. So what's going on here? Okay, we'll look at Windows kernel time. Yo, <clears throat> this is a stacked graph. Kernel time to here, and then SQL Server.exe is literally from here to here. My kernel time is over 30% across the board. I freak out when it's over 10%. What the heck is going on? Now, look at the per core numbers. This thing is, is just absolutely freaking out. <clears throat> it's a 16 core SQL Server. Eight of the 16 cores are literally between 50 and 88% the entire day. Of the eight that are left, half of them are sitting at functionally idle for most of the day, and a few more are a little busy, 30, 40%, but what the deuce is going on? Just doesn't make any sense. Okay, step number one. I didn't have access to the VM layer at this point in time, but Perfmon will tell you a lot. <clears throat> in the Perfmon counters list, there is a counter right here called processor information percent of maximum frequency. Normally, I see total and I see zero or maybe zero and one. Okay, here I get eight. That is the Numa node number. Somebody accidentally built this virtual machine with eight virtual sockets, each with two cores for a total of 16 cores. Okay, remember what I just said a minute ago. <clears throat> Windows and SQL Server Standard Edition can address a total of 24 cores or four sockets worth of cores, whichever is lower. Think about it. Windows and SQL Server could only use half the cores. <clears throat> Windows and SQL Server couldn't agree on which cores they couldn't use. <laughs> they were literally fighting each other inside the Windows kernel layer and just going absolutely berserk, and the SQL Server layer was suffering silently. You know how long it'd been like this? Two and a half years. So we took an emergency outage that night, and you know they were comfortable doing this. <clears throat> and I'm going to minimize this a little bit so I can show you a side by side on this. All I did go into VMware, right click, edit settings, go to CPU. We went from 16 cores to eight, and I went from eight sockets to one. So we had a one socket, eight core configuration. Take a look at the after here. <clears throat> okay, if I go here, so it's apples to apples, that on the right is after. Look at the scale, if you can see that pretty clearly, that is 40% busy. <clears throat> Whereas this guy was 60% busy around the clock. This looks like a normal day. You know, you got maintenance and stuff that's running after midnight, a couple reports were running, everybody logged on about 7, 7.30 in the morning, then everybody went and got a coffee and a smoke break. People got work done, people took a decent lunch, people got work done until about 4 or 4.30 and the place was a ghost town by 5. That's a normal day. Not this. Now, look at the per, so look at the kernel time. Remember before it was, you know, like 30 something percent. Here, active when everybody was logging on, onto about 7%. Burst during the day when this process was running just after every hour, no big deal. Active in the middle of the night. <clears throat> if you look at our per core numbers, this is actually fairly normal. Believe it or not, they had a single threaded process at the database layer that was doing backups from ETL and index maintenance. We fixed that. But look at during the day. <laughs> One core above 25%. Nice and quiet. So when we were done with this, we had gone from 16 cores and we actually downsized it again. It just went to four CPUs. It ran three and a half times faster than before because it wasn't fighting itself. They had four more CPU cores for a reporting server, four more for DR so they could turn it on whenever they wanted, and another four that they were able to reclaim for a future project that they were just about to buy some licensing for. SQL Server is incredibly NUMA aware, even standard edition, and the Windows layer is too. So this is, honestly, this is one of the worst examples I've ever seen. 
But getting NUMA right means less context switching. It means less virtual machine thrash. It means faster database performance. So hopefully that was the long-winded answer to that question there. <laughs> I thought that was great. Uh, and Graham's follow up was basically so it's probably better with one CPU with four cores than the other way around. Um, here's the funny thing VMware doesn't really extend NUMA most of the time if you're under eight CPUs. So I want it to say one socket, four core, because I want to see what I'm getting in guest. But if you do a four core or four socket, one core, you're probably still going to end up with a one socket four core machine, believe it or not. So I'm going to actually show you here in a minute how you can actually validate this pretty easily because the task manager lies to you. It's kind of scary. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> By the way, you can do four socket NUMA, but that gets a little more complicated. And if you've ever played with a Superdome, you can actually go up to a 32 way NUMA machine. But at that point, my head's about to explode with it. So I don't worry about it too much. <clears throat> Now, I mentioned locality, same thing. A remote memory lookup is more expensive. It used to be worse on older machines. The current generation of Intel Scalable and AMD Epic, the, it, the hit is there, you can measure it, but it's not as severe as it used to be. Now, here's the thing. <clears throat> How many CPUs do you need? I want to minimize the amount of stuff going into the schedulers so that the scheduler doesn't have to worry about what's, what it's doing. Now, the example here that people need to realize, granularity matters. I call this a right-sizing analysis. We've got to be granular. We've got to be really controlled with this. There's one environment. They had 32 cores on a SQL server. You can see from the image on the screen here. Um, they called up, like, this thing is slow as a dog. We don't know what's going on. It's, uh, CPUs are only 7% busy, so it's got to be the network. Where did you come up with the act of call or blaming the network? Well, apparently it was always the network admin's fault. Who knows why? <clears throat> Literally, pull up task manager. Somebody had been messing with CPU affinity and SQL server. It could only use the first two cores. It was suffering. Everything else was functionally a space heater. No big deal. Granularity matters. But now to minimize how much is going through the hypervisor, how many CPUs do you actually need? This is a tough one because if you talk to a DBA, you know, by nature of what they do and who they are, they're going to want all the cores and all the RAM. And I know we see this all the time. If you talk to an ISV, they're going to tell you you need all of these crazy amount of resources. Probably isn't true. But how do you determine what you actually need? And it really is get an operational consumption baseline with whatever tooling you've got. Perfmon can do it, <clears throat> DPA can do it, SQL Century can do it, Redgate SQL Monitor can do it, VROPS kind of does it. It does a really bad job with RAM, so be careful with that. Um, but the way I look at it, I want target utilization of CPU in about the 40 to 50, maybe 60% range during the peak time during the day. Now, if that peak time during the day is actually in the middle of the night when they're running database maintenance and they have plenty of headroom in there to run it, maybe disregard that. You know, you don't want it to run too long, but you know, if they have an eight hour window to run backups and index maintenance and it runs in 30 minutes, does it really matter if it takes an extra 10 minutes to run? Probably not. Leave headroom, but tighten it up. Most environments that I find, they're oversized on CPU and mostly oversized on memory. And that's a really tough one. You know, these are all real world examples. This was a normal SQL server, eight core, they wanted to go virtual this a couple of years back and they wanted to know how many CPUs to add. And I told them add minus four. <laughs> they don't need eight. This thing is nice and quiet. Minimize the impact in the schedulers. We did the testing at four cores and we actually found about a 10% net performance gain because Windows and SQL Server didn't have to manage as much and the hypervisor didn't have as much going on in the schedulers for this VM. Pretty cool. Three clicks to, to test, <laughs> it's kind of handy. Now, the VM administrators have generally a, I don't wanna say an incomplete point of view, but you don't have the time to micromanage this stuff. Literally, you're bouncing around your host, look at that, I've got RAM, I've got CPU, everything looks great, no problem. 
if they if you're lucky you'll go in and look at the sockets and cores per socket when you're setting up big virtual machines most of the time we just don't have the time to deal with this kind of stuff we just want to click there and get this stuff done and it's tough what you can see here does not mean that's what the virtual machine has received <clears throat> if you see down the bottom virtual machine yes that is a direct artifact of VMware and Microsoft talking together and something called the open virtualization format where the hypervisor can tell an instruction of the virtual machine that it is a virtual machine. VMware does this. Windows picks up on the socket versus processor count here. But because of all the quirks with VMware and how it presents CPU, that might not be what you get. So check this out. Inside SQL Server, if you right click on the SQL Server instance inside SQL Server Management Studio, right click on the instance, go to properties, click on processor, expand all, you'll actually see the NUMA nodes in here that you get. Most of the time it gets it right, occasionally it gets it wrong. Virtual machine NUMA is incredibly important even if you're on standard edition. Essentially, what we need to do is make sure that the virtual machine is aware of the underlying NUMA topology if it's bigger than one NUMA node. So in this example, we have a 10 core, 64 gig RAM VM, no big deal. Physical machine, 24 core, 256 gigs of RAM. So 12 core per socket, 128 gigs per socket. We need to make sure it fits. 10 fits inside 12 pretty comfortably, 64 gigs fits inside 128, no problem. Build it with one socket, 10 core, drop it in there, call it good. If the VM is bigger, like so in this case, 16 core, 128 gigs of RAM, 16 does not fit comfortably inside of 12. You, can, you might be able to mess with the, um, the prefer HT setting if you really want to leverage hyper-threading, but I don't recommend it. So set the VM for two socket by eight core. It'll split it down the middle and call it good. Now be warned here. The hypervisor layer does not look at the memory footprint when dealing with NUMA Home. So if I, in this scenario, if I need, let's say an eight core VM with 192 gigs of RAM, it'll look like it's one socket. You end up with a, a, a big NUMA imbalance because it's gonna be splitting the memory underneath while the CPU stays at one. Now the question, do I recommend separate clusters for SQL servers and turning off hyper-threading? I'm gonna split that into two questions here. Do I recommend turning off hyper-threading? The answer is no. <clears throat> um, Hyper-threading will help you in very limited sense, but what I do, leave it on and then just forget about it. I don't ever want to think of a hyper-threaded core as a full core. I want it there if, I, if, if the workload will use it, but I don't want to assign virtual machine CPUs on a single VM greater than the number of physical cores that exist on that host. Now, do I recommend separate clusters for SQL Server? That's a really good question. And it, it's standard DBA answer for any of you who meet a DBA in a dark alley. Standard answer, it depends. <laughs> I'm going to interject real quick. That's just a standard IT answer. Yes. <laughs> Not even a DBA answer. <laughs> standard, standard IT answer, it always depends. And it usually depends on how much caffeine or alcohol you have, right? Um, bottom line, it really does depend. If you have the kind of SQL Server scale to where you're applying your SQL Server licensing to the physical cores and not the virtual machine cores, then you definitely want to maximize your SQL Server licensing expense. For everybody on the call here, if you've never dealt with SQL Server Enterprise Edition licensing, um, on a 24 core host, you're probably looking at about a hundred grand worth of SQL Server licensing expense that makes your host almost a rounding error on the budget. That hurts. I need to maximize that licensing. So think of it this way. If I've got half of the RAM being consumed on that host by non-SQL server workloads, memory is usually your limiting factor. I don't want non-SQL server workloads to essentially be stealing licensing that I can use essentially for free at that point for more SQL servers. But now, if you are, you know, if you've got two or three SQL servers, it probably doesn't make sense to have the entire host fully licensed like that. So you're probably applying them to the virtual machine layer. And at that point, 
I don't necessarily recommend a separate cluster. I do recommend prioritizing the SQL Server workload over the other VMs. You can do this through very strategic use of resource pools. I don't like to go crazy with it. Usually what I do, three tier. I'm, I'm real creative with this. Tier one, tier two, tier three. <laughs> tier two has resource allocations for CPU and memory set to normal. Tier one has them both set to high. I don't like to deal with share values in there because if you add another host, people generally forget about it and it's not very good. Tier three is low. Simple as this. Tier one, business critical production, which almost always includes your production database servers. Tier two, eh, not so important production, utility servers, and a lot of stuff that we deal with from an IT infrastructure side, that kind of stuff. Tier three, everything dev test. Do not use resource uh, pools as folders, but literally if you do those three, tier one will take priority over tier two and tier three in the event that there's resource scheduling pressure. You do it that way, keeps it simple. Literally just drag it into it, call it good. That's how I recommend getting the most out of those licenses. Hopefully that answers that one for you. If it doesn't, let me know. <clears throat> now, I want you to verify your CPU presentation here. There is a free utility from Microsoft called CPU Core Info. It's available as part of the Sys internal suite, completely free, available at the link there. When you run this from a command line, you can get a logical to physical processor map. Now this is a VM, hyperthreading is not directly presented, so you almost always get a one-to-one -one on here. But now I can get a logical proc to a socket map, and you can see how these cores line up. You can also get a logical processor to NUMA node map, because sometimes a socket might not correspond to a NUMA node. It's kind of weird the way it lines up. I will tell you that VMware does a really good job with this. Other hypervisors, not so much. There are some hypervisors out there that cannot do NUMA properly, and I'm not going to name names to, um, to protect the innocent. I'm <coughs> uh, there are some challenges with this, so you got to be careful. The fun part about this is if you've got a VM that spans NUMA nodes, it'll actually tell you the relative cross NUMA node access cost for memory and CPU in terms of 1.x percent. It's really, really handy. I do this if I'm just double checking the configuration in there because it does add up. Now, <clears throat> here's the question at hand. How many vCPUs can I put on a host? And I can tell you, you can do a lot more than you probably think. And by the way, animation in PowerPoint is an absolute pain. <laughs> So in this environment, this looks pretty severe. It's a 24 core host. I got six VMs here, each with 16 cores. Believe it or not, that's only a two to one compression ratio or, or overcommit ratio. But this whole concept of number of cores, a uh, number of virtual cores for a number of physical cores, disregard that. It tells you nothing about what the individual workloads are actually doing. You know, if I've got one-to-one -one and the CPUs are just being slammed, there's probably not much room for anything else on there. If I got five-to-one and they're literally just sitting here idling, yeah, you could probably do more with it. So what do we need to do to actually look at the workload characteristics of what's actually running inside these things and make a judgment call based on that? Well, take a look at our CPU schedulers. So in this case, same thing. I got a bunch of VMs, different sizes on here, and we're going to say they're just normally busy. So they're constantly putting stuff into the hypervisor scheduling queues. It's like, okay, cool. So stuff is running. No big deal. Okay, now more stuff runs. What happens with more and more and more activity that's getting pumped into these scheduling queues? The VMs don't know it's going into queues, but it is. This is where we need to actually figure out how to measure the amount of time spent in the queue. It's a relative measurement that actually shows us just how much are we waiting on everything else, what sort of prioritization is going on or deprioritization, and it matters. Now, I know this is a VMware session. I wanted to throw this out there in case somebody is watching this. Hyper-V has a measurement of the waiting time on a virtual CPU, so does VMware. Hyper-V calls this CPU wait time per dispatch. It's measured in nanoseconds across all the virtual CPUs on the VM on the polling interval for Windows Perfmon, usually one second. Essentially, 
Take the counter value that you've got. If it's total, great, divided by the number of CPUs that you have, then divided by a million. That tells you the average percent performance loss on that virtual machine. And most of the time, be like half of 1%, maybe 1%, no big deal. But if you have a NUMA misalignment or another virtual machine that's just extremely busy and flooding the machine, or if there's just a lot of concurrent activity in there and our context switching is really starting to add up, yeah, this can really start to trickle upwards. Now look at VMware, <clears throat> exact same type of measurements called CPU ready time. Same kind of thing. Instead of nanoseconds, it's measured in milliseconds, the way VMware does it, it's more of a summation than it is at a point in time. It gives you the machine name and then the individual CPU cores. This is the real time view. <clears throat> take a look at this. If you take this, it's on a 20 second polling interval. So no exaggeration, take the value for the virtual machine, divide it by the number of CPUs, divide it by 20,000 milliseconds because there's 20,000 milliseconds in our sample interval, multiply it by 100%. If you're looking at an individual CPU core, take the value divided by 20,000 times 100. That's your average percent performance loss on that VM. So now we pull up Windows Calculator here if I can grab this. <clears throat> and I'll show you here. So our ready time calculation here at worst over the last hour, 449. This VM had 10 cores on it. 449 divided by 10 to get the average of all the cores, divided by 20,000 milliseconds times 100%, quite literally 0.2245% performance penalty. That's awesome. That's exactly what I wanna see in a production environment. That is fantastic and it rarely gets any better than that. Now here's the fun part, take that value and where's our warning threshold? Where's our alerting threshold? VMware gives you guidance around 10%. I claim that they're fooling themselves because 10% is way too high and your workloads are going to feel it. From a SQL Server perspective, what I've noticed is that some things go parallel, some things go single threaded, and you'll find that the in guest workload is roughly hit about twice as hard as what that value says. So if I say 5%, the net performance degradation is actually closer to 10%. So where's my warning threshold and where's my alerting threshold? I don't want to be too crazy with it. I want a little bit of overcommit carefully. But now what I always say, <clears throat> two and a half percent is my warning, three and a half percent is my alerting. Why those numbers? Two and a half percent and then double that to get the net impact is 5%. 5% on a normal SQL Server workload, nobody's going to know the difference. Okay, go three and a half percent. It really translates to 7%. At 7% hit, not that big of a deal. You start getting any more than those than that though. You're looking at you know, eight, nine, 10%. That's where your power users are going to notice. That's when they pick up the phone. And having been in IT for this long, that's the last thing I want. I wanna keep these overcommit penalties low enough to where nobody notices and it doesn't get in the way of any critical business processes. So those are my personal warning thresholds. Feel free to take those and adjust them. But essentially, if you can keep the overcommit penalty lower than what people notice and what is gonna impact my workload, guess what? I can actually get more on this physical machine than you might think. And that goes a long way to helping save SQL Server licensing, maintaining performance, doing all that kind of stuff. And that goes a long way for the business. There's one other measurement in here that not many people are aware of. <clears throat> so now let's just say I got a virtual machine, eight CPUs. Now the database engine has set something called a max degree of parallelism to just four. DBAs do this all the time. Essentially, if something goes parallel, we don't want that query to consume everything. So we'll tell it to consume a subset of the CPU time. So in this case, four cores, no problem. Okay, so it put the query into the operating system that thinks it's got direct access to the CPUs. VMware took it, it's sitting in the queue. Okay, great, boom. There is an imbalance in this scenario on the physical the hypervisor CPU schedulers. A bunch of them are held up, one of them is just racing through. Well, there's a challenge here. When this happens, 
we can't let these get too far out of balance. The operating system is not used to having things being run asynchronously like this or, or out of balance. It's expecting them to be run at the same time. It can cause issues with the environment just running things out of series that can cause instability. Thankfully, VMware understands this. <clears throat> the other hypervisors do too. They don't provide metrics on this. VMware does. What it does is it goes, hey, you're way ahead. So just hang on a second. It basically pauses that virtual machine CPU scheduler. It lets everybody else catch up. And then, hey, great, they caught up. And now we'll move ahead together. It's, you know, all part of being fair. VMware calls the state co-stop or as essentially SMP's co-scheduling, it stops the things that are further ahead to let everybody else catch up. Do not convert this to a percent. It is measured in the same milliseconds as before. It is the sum total value or the individual core values, depending on if you're looking at the individual CPU or the machine name itself. Same 20 second polling interval. I don't have an equivalent on Hyper-V or any of the other hypervisors out there, but the way I look at it, this is very, very critical. Nobody knows about this, and this is one of the biggest silent performance killers now. Take a look at the chart here. You see just little wiggles all over the place, couple milliseconds here, couple there. It's not that big of a deal. This is normal, especially for a larger virtual machine. Where I start to really pay attention is if you have sustained co-stop over periods of time, or if you see just a massive spike that goes way high, we're talking thousands of milliseconds or even higher, when that happens, that virtual machine is running so slow that it could actually disconnect applications and time out. When this happens, there is a major performance penalty that occurs, and this is when you actually need to go alert on this stuff. And for all intents and purposes, this is silent. VMware doesn't actually store this in the vCenter database. If you go look up this stat on the real-time view, no exaggeration, this is pulling from host memory. If you have vRealize Operations Manager, it collects it, but it's kind of hard to get to. And it does some really weird summation that can, it kind of muddies all of this. So go look at this in real time. If you want better history of this, adjust the vCenter statistics polling interval, the default values for the day, week, month, and year granularity on a scale of one to four, they're all one. My personal recommendation, go four, four, three, two from the top to the bottom, get much better granularity, store this for at least a week. And that way, if there's a performance problem, you have that telemetry to go back to. Now, <clears throat> here's the interesting thing. Your in-guest telemetry can actually be impacted by the CPU schedulers. So think of the in-guest measurement as sort of a metronome. Tick, tick, tick. There is a thing inside the physical CPU called the clock tick. It's just like a metronome. It beats 64 times a second. Windows Perfmon, and a lot of the end guest counters are actually differential counters. It's how many occurrences of something run per clock tick. But what happens if now, because of the CPU scheduling being variable underneath, here's my clock tick cycle. Tick, tick, tick. Tick, tick. What you end up with is a skew in the clock, which can actually skew your metrics. This could actually result in erroneous disk latency, CPU spikes, memory churn. In the database engine, you can have wait statistics that tells the DBAs that they're waiting on CPU time or memory access or disk. And it's valid from its point of view, but it could be a direct result of CPU scheduling causing the skew. So be really, really careful with this. Now, if you're ever interested in measuring this with something inside the virtual machine, I don't know if you know this, but as part of the VMware tools counter or packages, they load Perfmon counters. There is a VMware specific counter under the set VM processor. It sounds ominous. It's called CPU stolen time. Convert it to a percent. That calculation that I showed you with ready time, they actually take that calculation and pump it in guest so you can record it. The DBAs are starting to learn about this, and what you may find is that if there's a lot of activity going on on the host, they're tracking this. 
and they may be able to use this to try to pinpoint or at least blame that the virtualization layer is causing a challenge. Be careful with this. Now, from a database perspective, the DBAs have a couple of settings here that really do matter for us. One is called the cost threshold of parallelism. The other is the max degree of parallelism. When a database engine like this receives a query, so basically give me everything from the users table, select star from table users, <clears throat> it takes that command and tears it apart. Sometimes the logic can get really significant and severe, and it has to figure out how to go grab all this data and piece it all together. As a part of that calculation, it gives a cost value of parallelism. If that value for that command is higher than what this value here is set to, SQL Server will then look at the max degree of parallelism setting to figure out how many CPUs up to that it can try to parallelize that command on. The default value is that the cost threshold of parallelism is a value of five. There's no metric in it, uh, but it's honestly really low where it's going to try to parallelize rather aggressively. The max degree of parallelism is usually set to everything. So one bad command can flood the entire machine and kill all the CPU time. What I tell people is that increase the th cost threshold of parallelism to something that represents their workloads. And that's something I'll, I'll take offline. If anybody has any questions, I've got a bunch of, bunch of stuff on that. Um, the max degree of parallelism, it is workload specific, but if you have a virtual machine that has NUMA properly presented to the virtual machine, my starting point is that the max degree of parallelism should be the number of cores in one NUMA node. The database engine, even standard edition, will listen to this and it will try to take that workload and put it on one NUMA node because it's going to be a little bit quicker. So be careful with this and your, your mileage may vary with these. You might find that some environments, the cost threshold needs to be up or down or that things like reporting workloads or data warehouses, you might find that you want to crank the max degree of parallelism all the way up. It's very specific, but my starting point is bump up the cost threshold a little bit, set max stop to the number of cores in one virtual socket and call it good. If you do this right, <clears throat> you've now built a better foundation for the business. If you look at this, you got the database, max degree of parallelism, the virtual machine, the physical machine, some big old query comes along, the database engine is going to know to put that query on one NUMA node, that NUMA node aligns with the virtual and the physical environment underneath, and you end up with balance. It's more efficient, it's faster, and by doing it this way, I can maintain performance and actually get more work done on that physical machine. So I can now do more with less. I may be able to actually save on licensing so I can pay more, or so I can pay less for more work. It's pretty handy. Bottom line, virtualization works. We know this by now, but you can virtualize some really big things. Virtualization is also one of the first steps to getting to the cloud if that's the direction that the organization wants to go in. I claim if you do this right, you're at less than half of 1% on a normal server uh, versus bare metal. And to me, there are so few drawbacks to virtualization that really, it should be the assumption at this point, even for the big ones. Get the CPU, get the NUMA configuration proper, get the virtual disks presented appropriately, make sure that the database parallelization settings line up with the NUMA in the, the virtual machine and the physical machine, and you end up with a happy camper. You end up with DBAs that are happy. You've got a business that starts treating these systems transparently so that to get off your back, you can actually be more proactive with this stuff and just let it all just work. What questions do you all have? And by the way, if there's anybody watching the recording later on, feel free to contact me here. Throw any question you want my way. It may take me a day or two to respond, but I will definitely answer your questions. Well, that was going to be my question is how people get in touch with you, <laughs> David, but you, you hit that one out of the park already. Uh, you know, we'll give a moment and see if there are any additional questions. I'll just say thanks. This was a great session. I'm going to have to go back and watch it about three or four times before I absorb it all. There was so much good info. I'm not sure if I feel smarter or dumber now, smarter because I learned a lot of new things or dumber because there was so much I didn't know. <laughs> I knew this was an important topic because I see it come up all the time when working with customers, uh, but I don't didn't have these answers. Now I'm, I'm armed with a little bit more info than I was before an hour ago. So thank you. <laughs>
That's cool. We got a good question here. Um, mentioned a couple times about VROPS doesn't do SQL Server well. Quote, is it bad for VROPS generally? Um, quite frankly, so here's here's what it does really. Um, VROPS is actually pretty good on CPU scale. It may not have the granularity to understand the workload. So whatever recommendations you get on CPU, run that through, you know, any of the the SQL Server specific monitoring tools. We go one step further though, the memory footprint. This is where I have a really big bone to pick with things like VROPS, and here's why. SQL Server and other relational database engines and other applications that do their own memory management layer like Java, .NET, those sort of things, they hide what they're doing with memory from the operating system. The operating system doesn't know the difference. It just knows we've got a really big executable with a really big footprint. <clears throat> okay. Now take a look at what VMware does. There is this counter in there called the active memory counter. What the active memory counter is telling VMware admins is that this is how much memory the virtual machine is using. <clears throat> it's not accurate. The counter is actually measuring the amount of memory that has been read from or written to in the previous 20 seconds. So let's take a SQL server with half a terabyte of RAM. How much of that are you actually reading from or writing to in the last 20 seconds? Probably not a lot. It's a storage read cache. It's there for a reason. If you're thrashing all of that in 20 seconds, we need to talk because something ain't right. So as a result, it's going to think that you're using less RAM than you actually are. And it's making mega recommendations based on an invalid assumption on this active memory counter. I've seen environments where it's going, this SQL server needs 128 virtual CPUs and four gigs of RAM. No. <laughs> the memory counters at a database engine and all these other things are completely useless in VMware. They're application specific. So if you, if you need to work with your database administrators, they have a ton of counters in there inside the database engine itself that will tell you very explicitly how they're using memory, how, mo how long it's sitting in RAM before it gets flushed out to make room for new data coming back from disk. There's things like memory grants, pending, page life expectancy, buffer cache hit ratio. There's a lot of really good stuff in there. So VRAPS is okay for CPU, throw out its recommendations for RAM, work with the DBAs directly. They'll have all of the telemetry. They, they really should. And they'll be able to give you a really good picture. How much RAM do we need? How much are we actually using? And you'd be surprised at the amount of memory that these SQL servers actually do crush. And if you don't have enough RAM, it goes to storage and your storage reads are going to go through the roof. So be careful with those. Good stuff. Uh, cool. <laughs> I'm just going to pause and say thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us tonight or watching this on YouTube. Uh, I think we're going to call it there. Uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. If you ha have any further questions, just reach out to David uh, via the various methods that he's listed here. Cool. Actually, we have one more question. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, is it better to have more SQL servers in one instance per server or one server in more instances? It's up to you and your licensing. My preference is one instance per SQL server so that I'm doing resource management at the VM layer only and not having to worry about different SQL servers in one VM colliding with each other. But if your licensing footprint dictates that you have multiple instances in a VM, just be careful with those settings and how they compete and collide. But you know, you can you can do what you need. I just prefer the other way because it's just easier to manage. Cool. Great questions. <laughs> Great stuff. Thanks very much, David. Awesome. Thank you. Have a good one. Yep, you too. Thanks, everybody, for watching. And like I said, let me know if there's anything I can answer for you. <laughs>